Hello and welcome again to Why Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, brought to you by the UCD Centre for War Studies. The papers in this panel examine armed conflict and the military as elements in political strategies. Our first speaker is Stefan Kurz, a research assistant at the Military History Museum in Vienna and the PhD candidate at the University of Vienna. In this talk, Stefan will consider the efforts of Austrian Social Democrats to build a military force that was fit for the purposes of the newly established Austrian Republic after World War I. The Social Democrats believed that an army could only be reliably Republican if it were controlled by themselves. We do not usually associate socialist parties with the creation of political militias, but as Stefan shows, the short-lived volunteer Volkswehr was just that sort of thing. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today about the specific phenomenon in Austrian military history that is probably little known internationally, but seems to me to be an extraordinary example of markedly politicized armed forces among Western liberal democracies, the so-called Volkswehr. In this paper, I would like to focus on the question which purpose these armed forces were expected to serve and analyze in how far they resembled a political army and by which means political influence was exerted. The Volkswehr came into existence as a consequence of the collapse of the Habsburg monarchy and the emergence of a new state called Deutsche Österreich or German Austria. The disintegration of Austria-Hungary accelerated in mid-October 1918. On 30th of October 1918, the Provisional National Assembly, comprising all German speakers among members of parliament, claimed sovereignty for all predominantly German-speaking areas of the Austrian part of the empire and thereby de facto constituted the new state. On the same day, it also established a government composed of social democrats, Christian socials and German nationals, created among others a Staatsamt für Herwesen or Ministry of Military Affairs and demanded authority over the troops in German-Austrian territory. Already on 1st of November 1918, the new government started to swear the troops in and announced that soldiers' councils were to be elected among the troops in the hinterland. All this happened four days before the armistice of Villa Tuesday came into force on 4th of November 1918, which ended the war for the Habsburg Empire. This shows that at first it was intended to draw on existing formations of the Austro-Hungarian army, but already on 2nd of November 1918, the State Council made the decision that instead an entirely novel volunteer force should be set up. In a proclamation on the next day calling for volunteers, it promised that the military service will be based on a democratic fundament and monitored by soldiers' councils. This policy was essentially devised by the social democratic politician Julius Deutsch. He had been a reserve officer in the First World War, and in 1918, he served as a liaison to the trade unions in the war ministry. This position enabled him to organize a network of social democratic confidence among the troops in the garrison of Vienna, and this in turn gave him an influential position in the late days of October 1918, when the discipline of the soldiers in the capital deteriorated. Because of that, he was appointed undersecretary in the Ministry of Military Affairs. Despite his initially subordinate position, Julius Deutsch was almost from the outside the dominant actor in military politics until 1920. His power was so widely acknowledged that in February 1919, State Secretary Meyer and his two undersecretaries saw themselves prompted to publicly declare that they all had their share of power in the ministry. However, in 1921, Deutsch openly stated in his memoirs that only he was fully respected by the rank and file soldiers of the Volkswehr and therefore was de facto in power from the beginning. On 4th of November 1918, the recruitment started and the number of Volkswehr soldiers rose to about 60,000 in December 1918. Due to the dire economic condition of the state and the high cost of the Volkswehr, as well as demands to this effect by Italy, France and Great Britain, the strength of the Volkswehr was soon to be reduced and fell to about 28,000 soldiers until September 1919. The structure and armaments of the Volkswehr showed that it consisted mainly of territorial light infantry battalions with little mobility and no higher formations and command levels apart from the Landesbefehlshaber as territorial commanders. The influence of the state governments was substantial and their consent was required in important matters. 
This makes very clear that these armed forces were not primarily designed for national defense. This brings me to the discussion of the purpose of the Volkswehr. There is ample evidence that supports the finding that these armed forces were not even officially in the first place meant to defend the borders of the country. The primacy of internal tasks was confirmed on several occasions and by several official statements. In line with this, State Secretary Meyer even declared in the National Assembly in December 1918 that the task of the Volkswehr was to restore the order to some extent, but that it couldn't be expected to defend contested borders. This limitation of the purpose of the Volkswehr wasn't only an expression of pacifistic desires after the horrors of the World War, but was rather the consequence of the fact that the country was anyways too weak economically and too dependent on the victorious powers to consider a serious defense of the claimed borders. In this respect, one has to take into account that the Volkswehr was right from the start considered to be an interim solution. However, the main parties finally all agreed that a Swiss model militia based on compulsory military service was to substitute the Volkswehr. This was even laid down in the first provisional defense law of February 1919, but was not realized before the conclusion of the peace treaty. Later, the unanimous wish of all political parties to establish a militia system instead of a standing army was rejected by the provisions of the peace treaty. The main purpose of the Volkswehr, upholding the internal order, naturally also included the defense of the new democratic and republican legal and, and institutional order. All parliamentary parties agreed on that. However, there was disagreement on what this meant for the character of the armed forces and the outlook of its members. Here, I return to the question of motives for the break with the old army and the creation of a novel volunteer force. A main factor for this step was, as mentioned, the deterioration of discipline among available troops in the hinterland in the last days of the war. One has to keep in mind that on the day on which the establishment of the Volkswehr was announced, the armistice of Willa Tuesday was just signed and not yet in force. In the days after, several formations, occasionally even entire divisions, returned to this hinterland in good order, but after arriving in their home garrisons, lost their discipline and dissolved. The evidence therefore is ambivalent and it might be asked whether the way re returning troops were received and approached was a factor for their behavior after the return. Nonetheless, even the Secretary of State for Military Affairs, Meyer, declared in December 1918 that the erosion of discipline had been too widespread and that a volunteer force was therefore unavoidable. For leaders and activists of the Social Democratic Party, it was anyways a fundamental conviction that the buildup of a new force and the influence of the Social Democrats among workers had been the only means to safeguard the order and avoid anarchy. However, another motive played a role here as well, and in retrospect, leading Social Democratic politicians like Julius Deutsch and Otto Bauer made this very clear. The Social Democrats rejected the old officer corps since for them it represented the staunchest pillar of the old regime and considered them as too alienated from the people, which they linked in part to their supranational attitude. They perceived the officers as detested by the rank and file soldiers and the people and as opponents of the new order, or in other words, incurable reactionaries. Rudolf Deutsch therefore pursued the policy to del deliberately bypass the still existing old military formations in planning for a new army. Therefore, the Social Democrats decided a new force based on a revolutionary or voluntary discipline. This made it necessary in their view to incorporate as many organized workers in the Volkswehr as possible. So whereas politicians like Deutsch or Bauer insisted that the Volkswehr was open to everyone, with a Republican attitude, they also stated that workers were the ones willing to join military service and having Republican attitudes, or as Bauer said, back then being a Republican meant being a socialist. Because of these policies and attitudes, political opponents of the Social Democrats considered the Volkswehr to be a Parteigarde, meaning party army. But not only opponents, but also sympathizers of the Volkswehr did so, like Colonel Theodor Körner, who later became president of the Republic of Austria and was in 19 the most important military advisor of Julius Deutsch. Even Julius Deutsch and Otto Bauer admitted in 1921 in retrospective 
that the labeled party army was in a way justified, but insisted that if this hadn't been the case, the Volkswehr would have drifted to extremes on the left or right. So for the Social Democratic Party at this point of time, only an army controlled by the Social Democrats and disposing of counterbalances against the authority of officers could be a Republican army. Apart from admitting as many Social Democrats as possible into its ranks, several instruments should serve this purpose. The first of these instruments was a novel and visionary institution that should allow for civil and democratic control of the military and make sure that the spirit of the democratic constitution is retained in the army, the civil commissariat. It was established on 20th of November 1918 on the initiative of the Social Democrat Hugo Schulz, who was a journalist at the party newspaper Arbeiterzeitung and had acquired a reputation as military expert. Two representatives of each of these three main parties served as commis commissioners. In order to fulfill its function, the civil commissariat had the right to monetary recruitment and, and administration of personnel and to discharge unfit or unreliable soldiers. It was authorized to make proposals regarding the promotion of officers and NGOs and disciplinary and service regulations in order to promote the democratic principle. It oversaw the service and uh, educated soldiers concerning their rights and obligations. The Commissariat also encompassed a Secretariat for the Soldiers' uh, Councils and the Soldiers' Council at the highest level, called Reichsvollzugsausschuss, was based at the Civil Commissariat. This brings us to the main instrument for ensuring political control over the army and upholding desired political attitudes, the Soldiers' Council. As mentioned, the State Council decided, decided to take charge of the already emerging Soldiers' Councils on uh, 31st of October 1918 and mandated uh, the election of such councils. Consequently, this institution was then also integrated into the Volkswehr. Soldiers' Councils were established at every level of command that ranged from companies right up to the Ministry of Military Affairs. Also, from January 1919 onwards, plenary assemblies of all deputies of Soldiers' Councils were convened. The plenary assembly of Viennese Soldiers' Council delegates and the Executive Committee for Vienna turned out to be especially influential and became a central instrument in managing the domestic political turmoil in spring and summer 1919. The responsibilities of the Soldiers' Councils, however, were never clearly specified as long as the Volkswehr existed. The Provisional Defense Law of February 1919 only stipulated that the Soldiers' Councils should represent the interests of soldiers and ensure that the Republican spirit is cultivated in the army. This is one of the reasons why the Soldiers' Council delegates retained a much stronger position in Austria than in Germany. Although no command authority was granted to them, they had a substantial influence on the organization of military service, the authority of officers, and the deployment of troops. This was especially true for Vienna, where the majority of troops was in garrison. The territorial command of Vienna even concluded that Viennese Volkswehr should better not uh, be deployed outside of Vienna, and that the consent of the Soldiers' Council delegates on all important decisions was indispensable. State Secretary Julius Deutsch himself made clear that the ex Executive Committee of Soldiers' Councils had the real authority of command among soldiers in Vienna, that the officers had to come to terms with the committee, and that he himself sought to negotiate with the committee ahead of important orders. In light of this, the territorial command of Vienna even tried to conclude a wide-ranging treaty with the Executive Committee of the Viennese Soldiers' Councils in order to achieve its formal guarantee not to interfere in the authority of officers. This, however, uh, failed because the executive committee insisted to retain the right to act on its own authority when it feared reactionary proceedings. This aspect was the reason why social democratic politicians like Julius Deutsch, Otto Bauer, or civil commissioner Hugo Schulz believed soldiers' councils to be indispensable, although they admitted that their interference with the authority of officers was diminishing military effectiveness. Otto Bauer, for example, stated that soldiers' councils will be necessary as long as there was no socially homogeneous and republican-minded army. Because of this, the Social Democrats demanded that the prospective officers had to be exclusively, exclusively selected from the ranks of the ordinary enlisted soldiers. 
one transi transitional uh, measure in this respect was that Julius Deutsch appointed distinguished NGOs to be officers, the so-called Volkswehr lieutenants. Another instrument to ensure the side political attitudes among the officers was the stipulation that no officer could be permanently assigned to a battalion without the four week trial period and the consent of the soldiers council. In Vienna, even commanders of companies and battalions had to be confirmed by the soldiers councils of the battalions. Many questions whether the political attitudes that were to be fostered by these means were only Republican or rather those of social Democrats. Be that as it may, the, the soldiers' councils were clearly not mere bulwarks of the Republic, but rather very partisan institutions, as numerous statements demonstrate. For example, the Plenary Assembly of Soldiers' Councils declared in January 1919 that it was uh, determined to fight for the noble aims of international so socialism. And in April 1919, the Viennese Executive Committee of Soldiers' Councils even tried to make a service contract obligatory for all Volkswehr soldiers that demanded them to confirm that they will abide by the program of socialism in every possible manner. Another main instrument for the cultivation of these political attitudes was the establishment of the so-called Reichsbildungsamt of the Volk Volkswehr, an institution that was responsible for the promotion of education among Volkswehr soldiers. It was initiated by the soldiers' councils and was based on education councillors that were appointed for all battalions. Head of this institution was the socialist writer and activist Louis Bolstern. He based the educational system in the Volkswehr on the model of popular, popular education of the workers' movement. He linked it also to his institutional and op institutions and opened activities and establishments to adherents of the workers' popular education movement. The Volkswehr education offered training courses and uh, lectures and uh, organized libraries, movie screenings, theater performances, and more than 20 touring exhibitions. They did not aim at content that might increase the military skills of soldiers, but rather wanted to convey civil and public education content for a civil audience that the activities of the Volkswehr education system were also not uh, politically neutral is demonstrated by the fact that Stern declared in March and April 1919 that the purpose of the Reichsbildungsamt will, not, will, will be not only to promote general education, but also uh, revolutionary education and make soldiers familiar with uh, Marxist uh, ideology and the idea of class struggle. In line with that, courses on introduction to socialism and history of the revolution were offered. It therefore doesn't come as a surprise that the Volkswehr education was perceived as party school by, by conservative politicians. However, despite recurrent radical rhetorical statements of delegates of soldiers' councils that even sympathized with the Soviet republics in Hungary and Bavaria, the soldiers' councils turned out to be rather moderate in terms of practical politics. Military commanders who were willing to make arrangements with soldiers' councils and engage in negotiations were able to uphold their authority. Furthermore, the Volkswehr also contributed to political stability in the Republic in the short and midterm in the year 1919. This was the result of the policy of Social Democrats to use uh, the uh, soldiers' councils in order to uphold the control over the army and fend off reactionary threats to the Republic as well as leftist radicalization. Indeed, there were strong communist sentiments among workers in 1919. The establishment of the Soviet Republic in Hungary in March 1919 amplified these tendencies since its government was eager to steer efforts to establish a Soviet Republic in Austria. Julius Deutsch reacted to this with a policy that included on the one hand radical political rhetoric that should signal that social democrats remained loyal to the principles of Marxism and fortify the leading role of the party among workers. On the other hand, he pursued a course of moderate politics and strictly objected any overt support of the so Soviet Republic in Hungary or efforts to erect a similar system in Austria. He thereby succeeded to keep the Volkswehr a loyal instrument of the government, even in situations of massive communist agitation and armed clashes with fatalities and spare the country similar upheavals in domestic politics as they occurred in Germany and Hungary. However, this policy that was stabilizing and successful in the short run had diversive effects in the long term. 
because it was a defining experience for all non-leftist political actors. They felt very threatened and pressured by what they thought was a usurpation of the state and its instruments of power. This triggered the organization of right-wing and le later left-wing paramilitary forces. The stage for distrust and competition between right-wing and left-wing parties was set, and the army of the First Austrian Republic remained a bone of contention between the parties. Thank you very much. <laughs>